everyone again to the 2DCC MIP uh, webinar series. We have Dr. Roman Engel Herbert here today from the Material Science and Engineering Department, um, and he's going to be talking about hybrid growth approaches and hybrid materials options. Roman? Thank you, Kevin, and thank you everybody for uh, coming out and uh, for the people who uh, joined into this webinar. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, hybrid growth approaches and hybrid materials options. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is covering a couple of unconventional uh, growth opportunities uh, that are available to the user base in the 2DCC MIP here at Penn State. And um, as you, how do I advance? Oh, can you advance? Okay, so uh, the, the focus of the center is uh, 2D layered materials. Uh, it actually turns out that this is quite a ubiquitous uh, structural motif in calcogenite based crystals. So there's a large variety of crystal structures that show uh, these uh, layered structures. You can see here's a selection of a few 2D layered materials uh, ranging from uh, bismuth selenite, uh, that is a topological insulator, molybdenum sulfide, a semi semiconductor. And you can basically go uh, all around. Here's gallium selenide, also a semiconductor. And, and what, you, what you take from this is that there's a, a quite a host of diverse chemistries uh, with which you can populate these crystals. Uh, uh, still maintaining a very high uh, structural anisot anisotropy. And, and associated with uh, how we're arranging these elements and given this uh, uh, very high anisotropy in this crystal, uh, what we're finding is that, that we're having access to an interesting uh, features in band structures that provides us intriguing features that are typically not found in, uh, in conventional semiconductor materials. I'll give you uh, a couple of examples. Um, we, we can... Uh, there's a lot of uh, superconductors uh, found in this uh, class of materials, as I already uh, pointed out, topological insulators, uh, but also uh, things like uh, piezoresistive materials. So whenever you apply uh, stress to the material, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the position of the atoms. So you're going to change uh, the orbital overlap. And with this, uh, quite dramatically, the band structure, and you're going to see a whole lot of change in the uh, transport phenomena in those materials, uh, such as samarium selenide in this case. So the other interesting thing about the material is that um, you actually have uh, quite a few materials degrees of freedom available at your hand in order to tune the properties. Uh, for example, uh, you can change the dimensionality. As I said, they're highly anisotropic, so you could start exfoliating them. It really matters what's on top and below uh, <coughs> the, the, the material. You could alter the layering scheme, uh, what kind of layers you're going to put on top um, since there is uh, a whole lot of room between the layers, uh, you could think of intercalation uh, strategies. And uh, as soon as you combine them uh, with other materials, you're going to see that uh, the proximity to these other materials is going to change uh, the properties as well. And so there's a whole new host of things that you can do with these materials. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, there's going to be transformative new science uh, that will be discovered in those in those classes, and and that might trigger the next generation of electronics. But first and foremost, uh, before you start uh, doing these kinds of things, you need high quality material, and this is what the center is going to be about. Um, can you advance? Okay, so uh, I'm I'm an MBE grower, and whenever I look into uh, combining elements to form compounds. I'm looking into uh, the periodic table, into my landscape, and what's available to me. And this is really some sort of a, uh, a pain map uh, for, for people who do physical vapor deposition. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the, uh, the amount of temperature needed in your effusion cell in order to effuse sufficient uh, atoms out of this effusion cell uh, to form a film to get uh, appreciable growth rate. And what you can see here is that um, if, if you look in the group 6, um, this is where the calcogenite is, so it's basically everything below oxygen. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of oxides, but you know we are now moving down the column. They are the calcogenite, sulfur, selenium, tellurium. And uh, you know among the classes that I talked about, you can see a topological insulators. These are high Z uh, elements like antimony and bismuth. And then you can uh, uh, walk uh, across the periodic table and you're going to meet the group 4 calcogenites, group 3 calcogenites, and then uh, uh, finally uh, transition metal calcogenites uh, that are uh, of the form MX or, or MX2. 
um, where uh, M is the transition metal element and X is the calcogenite. Um, so you can see if you look into this, uh, into this uh, map that there are some uh, dramatic differences in the vapor pr uh, pressures, in particular in the case when you're trying to grow transition metal dicalcogenites or monocalcogenites. Uh, <clears throat> a good example is uh, while you don't have too much of an issue uh, in the case of iron selenite, uh, a material uh, that's of, of a lot of interest and in uh, got the community really um, uh, interested in integrating this with oxides, you can see that uh, these things become uh, much, much harder if you're trying to grow the uh, superconductor niobium diselenite because niobium is a very refractory uh, element. And so uh, what's also pretty clear, this is something that you cannot see from this, uh, from this panel, but it's becoming pretty clear if you're looking into the crystal structures, is these are open structures, they are layered. And so that typically puts me uh, into a, a complicated situation to make sure that atoms that I'm going to put in are really going to land where I'm support, you know, where they're supposed to go. Uh, whenever you want to do uh, dopant, uh, you really have to make sure that they are not going interstitial, since there's so much room in the crystal. It's becoming pretty tough, and we'll see what the issues of those are. Um, and then, um, when you have these open structures, then you also have a very high uh, bulk diffusivity, and you can you can uh, use this to your advantage. But uh, many many times, it actually comes to your disadvantage. And then. Uh, if you think about uh, monocalcogenite, um, they could form a rock salt structure, and rock salt structure is also uh, very much known to form and accommodate a lot of defects. So uh, this seems to be quite a, a, a challenging task at hand, uh, which makes it uh, very interesting. Next slide. Okay, so here again is the overview of the 2D crystal consortium platform. This is really what we want to do, and we want to do this together with you. Uh, we want to develop custom deposition tools with in situ and real time characterization of monolayer and few layer film growth. Uh, we also want to uh, have unique capabilities available to you in terms of simulation and reaction kinetics, uh, where we are combining a first principle or active potential approaches uh, with experiments. And so, uh, what I'm going to be covering today is uh, what you see here in the uh, green triangle is uh, this hybrid MVE approach that we believe uh, gives us. Uh, quite a bit of an advantage uh, when, we are when we are tasked to grow transition metal uh, calcogenites. And I also want to show you uh, on an example uh, how experiment and simulation uh, can work together. This is um, uh, work uh, has been done in, in collaboration with uh, Adri van Duin's group here at Penn State. Um, and so with that, I want to present you the overview of this talk. As I already mentioned, I'm going to talk about the green triangle. I then want to uh, show you a little bit uh, uh, the lessons uh, that were learned as, as synthesizing those materials and also the, you know, you know for, forecasting a little bit the challenges that are ahead of us. Uh, and I'm going to cover the role of substrates, uh, issues in film nucleation, and, and then typically one of the things that we have to deal with is the formation of uh, calcogenite vacancies in these structures. Then um, I want to show you uh, potential ways to overcome some of those challenges uh, using a theory synthesis team approach. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the example of uh, the nucleation behavior of alumina on germanium uh, 001. And then at the end, uh, sort of as a smoking gun, I want to show you that uh, we actually have the capabilities within the center to integrate calcogenites with oxides. Uh, and this is coming from, uh, from an in vacuum connection where we integrated uh, this uh, reactor with an existing MBE epitaxy system. Okay. So this is uh, a wide range of growth capabilities that are available, and um, they are ranging in, in case of thin films all the way from solid source MBE that you see on the left. Uh, all of these capabilities uh, and the things that we, we can do with this were covered by uh, one of the earlier webinars back in uh, 2016. And we also covered uh, and introduced uh, the MOCVD capabilities. Uh, Professor Regwing uh, was covering those uh, roughly a month later, uh, and uh, also in 2000, fall 2016. And uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to talk about uh, the hybrid MBE approach that we have available as well, sort of the sort of sits in the middle between these two extremes of physical vapor deposition and chemical vapor deposition. And with that, I think uh, we, we, we are striving uh, a lot of uh, uh, capabilities uh, here. Um, 
So this is designed for the hybrid MBE reactor for calcogenides. What I want to do is I want to uh, go a little bit uh, through them and, and explain uh, uh, why we decided uh, to do it this way. Um, take home message here is that the system is designed for high throughput of material, short downtime, but also maximum flexibility uh, for the user. So we are, we are relatively flexible to quickly change whenever you come in with, um, uh, with uh, proposals. Uh, we are really able to accommodate uh, different requests. So the, the reactor is uh, a relatively small reactor uh, from, from DCA. It's uh, a very conventional MBE reactor uh, that's uh, optimized to have a, a low background pressure. Uh, it's equipped with uh, effusion cell ports, uh, very standard. You can see them there right here. They go around. Um, and it also has an RF plasma source, uh, mainly for substrate surface cleaning, but also for chemical conditioning if needed. Uh, in order to uh, control the nucleation of the films uh, better. Also, what's, uh, what's here is an e-beam evaporator. You can see the vessel uh, uh, down here. And um, the location of the e-beam evaporator is a little bit awkward. The reason for this is we wanted to optimize the uh, long throw distance in order to make sure that the thermal load on the sample during growth is, um, is small. And also, um, this is uh, controlled uh, in situ, so while we're depositing uh, we have a flux control in parallel, and so having a long throw distance helps us um, minimizing uh, flux deviations uh, that are going to happen uh, at this as sample surface. Um, we have the capabilities to load up to a three inch wafers in the system, and it also comes with a, sem a special sample holder that allows us to directly grow on substrates that are mounted on a, on a T Omicron holder. Um, the, the excitement, and this is where these things uh, get uh, a little bit uh, unusual, this is what makes it hybrid, is uh, this uh, cluster flange that you see here in green. This cluster flange uh, has multiple gas injector lines, and it allows us to supply high vapor pressure metal organic um, precursor. And then all of these sections that I just pointed out um, can be uh, individually uh, gate, gate valve isolated. And so that means that we can do maintenance on the system while we are growing with other parts of the system. So again, it's really set up for high throughput, short downtime, and maximum uh, flexibility. OK, so the other thing that we, we were focusing on here, you see uh, the system in, in side view. Uh, the big vessel here in the middle is the, is the E-beam uh, port that I, that I pointed out, uh, is uh, in situ. Uh, calibration, uh, we have uh, reflection high energy electron diffraction. But we also uh, have the system equipped with in situ spectroscopic ellipsometry. And I'm going to show you in the second part of the talk how powerful in situ real time spectroscopic ellipsometry can be. Um, we also have, uh, uh, of course, fully automatic flux calibration procedures. And we are using gate valve isolated beam flux monitor and heated quadrupole mass spectrometer. These are these two little yellow uh, arms that you see here uh, in order to determine uh, the flux um, in, in, in quantitative ways. OK, so um, let, me, let me look at uh, this particular challenge where hybrid MBE is, is, is coming in very handy when you're trying to grow transition metal uh, calcogenites. Uh, the problem is if you're supplying uh, the calcogen and you're supplying this uh, low vapor pressure uh, refractory metal, uh, what you're going to experience is that, that there's going to be a very high thermal load uh, uh, when, when we are supplying the low vapor pressure transition metal. And you're also going to keep the, the background pressure in the, in the MBE system low. And so all, all this together, along with the high volatility of the calcogen, you're going to have the formation of vacancies. And so what you need to do is, uh, you need to lower the growth temperature, but this is going to limit your surface diffusivity. And so as an outcome, what you're going to typically see is, uh, on the next slide, um, you're going to see that uh, these, these films uh, don't like to grow in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion. The, 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 the typical temperatures at which you're growing them are relatively small, and so uh, you typically end up with grain sizes. Uh, that are very uh, small. So it, it turns out that uh, this unfavorable combination of surface divisivity uh, of the transition metal element versus uh, the volatility of calcogenide and, and the bulk diffusion uh, is, is going to be a challenge. And so the idea is 
that we supply the transition metal element in a more volatile form, ideally in a form that uh, it tends to have a higher surface diffusivity. And so what we believe is that uh, you know, the, the metal organic precursors are the right way to do this. Um, what you see on the next slide is uh, a map of uh, precursors available for all the different elements. And you can see that the one that I just highlighted before, uh, the one for molybdenum, tantalum, uh, and tungsten, and, and also hafnium, they are actually available. Uh, and you can also see from this overview, it's a relatively old overview, um, you can see that uh, for some of these precursors, uh, people successfully deposited elemental film, like tantalum. So, so what it means is that there are you know, available precursors, and um, they allow you to supply the uh, transition metal element in its elemental form. And, and it's expected that uh, with, with the current efforts in making these materials better, there will be advancement in the development of these uh, metal organic precursors as well. And so this map is going to get more and more populated as we, as we go along in time. Um, what I also want to point out, I'm sorry, what I also wanted to point out is that uh, what's interesting here is the low temperature supply. Um, these uh, metal organic precursors have a very, very high volatility. Uh, typically, you don't need any carrier gas to inject or introduce them in the ultra high vacuum environment. So this low temperature supply, along with the higher surface diffusivity, makes them uh, potentially a better choice. OK. So this seems, though, that we are, we're setting ourselves up in the right way. Uh, I want to. I want to tell you a little bit uh, from the background as to why we think this is uh, another potential avenue to go. I want to uh, quickly talk about some of the lessons that we have learned over the past couple of years and then derive the challenges ahead. Um, can you advance, please? Thank you. So uh, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the efforts in growing uh, abysmal selenite a topological insulators. And what you're seeing here, this is this is work from Sean Schick's old group at, at Rutgers. And you should look at this and sort of go uh, clockwise uh, around those panels. Uh, basically, the idea was uh, to grow bismuth selenite, uh, starting off with a fairly um, chemically inert substrate. Sapphire is a good choice. Uh, then to, to nucleate a three quintuple layer of the bismuth selenite uh, at low temperature, then increase uh, the deposition temperature to about 300. Uh, so it's relatively low deposition temperature. And then start growing the film to then, once you're done uh, with the film growth, uh, cool it down to room temperature and do measurements. And uh, uh, what they experienced was uh, when they took ARPIS measurements that um, bulk and surface bands were actually occupied. And they attributed this to a band bending phenomena uh, that was caused by the interface or the traps that were formed at this aluminum oxide bismuth selenide. Uh, film interface. So when looking into the Hall measurements, they saw uh, pronounced uh, nonlinearities. They, they were aware of the fact that there were multiple uh, uh, conduction channels contributing to their signal. And they attributed this to uh, a surface and bulk uh, transport. And uh, what they found was that they, in order to be successful and actually be able to probe uh, the topologically protected state and not you know, being swept away by the uh, carrier concentration in the bulk. They needed to lower the carrier concentration. But they also found that uh, in this very initial experiment, uh, they had fairly low uh, mobilities, all pointing towards the fact that there was band bending downwards as uh, bismuth selenide was uh, close to the aluminum oxide substrate, which caused a lot of uh, contribution to the conductivity. OK, so there's two, two options that you have. Uh, have a better substrate. Uh, and or try to take care of the problem by compensating it. So the first option was, uh, you know, the idea was to uh, grow the bismuth selenite and uh, uh, dope it with copper, basically putting copper at the bismuth site, and and see if you can uh, if you can form acceptor states and then take care of this excess uh, carrier concentration that you don't want. Uh, that was successfully done. But the interesting thing is that there was only the incorporation of around. 3% of copper into the bismuth selenide. You can see here that this was the minimum sheet carrier concentration that they were able to accomplish. They got below the 10 to the 13 per centimeter squared that they wanted to be. But as they were trying to put more and more copper in to make it better, 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 uh, they found out that this is not working very well. In fact, uh, copper was, uh, was starting to, to sit interstitial, donating electrons. 
and they got the opposite effect, and this is the reason why the sheet carrier concentration uh, shooted up quite dramatically, uh, exponentially, actually, uh, when, they, when they started to uh, put more uh, um, uh, copper in, into film. Also, you can see that uh, for this, this perfect uh, uh, concentration of copper, they got uh, very high mobility, so um, it was a clear indication that they, they could uh, fix their problem of, uh, of the band bending. Uh, they could reduce the carrier concentration in the system, and they saw uh, the high mobility channels that they were looking at, uh, that they, they were looking for. Okay, so what they also tried was uh, finding better substrate matches, and so th the first idea was that aluminum oxide with a uh, whopping uh, lattice mismatch of 14% is just not a good start. Uh, although, you know, it's chemically inert. Um, so the idea was to grow uh, on indium phosphide uh, that had a much, much smaller lattice match. But uh, what, what was experienced uh, in, in various uh, different uh, uh, papers, here's, here's one uh, uh, from Anthony Richardella, um, was that um, whenever you're growing on indium phosphide 111, it's, it's much harder to, to get a nice uh, uh, surface uh, typically, you're ending up with textured surfaces, twins, and, and again, small grain sizes. So, so even though just uh, working out a, a better lattice match uh, is not the only thing that actually matters, it also matters uh, the chemical inertness and how the layered, the, the layered calcogenite that you want to grow on is going to bond to the substrate. So the idea, the way out was to uh, grow indium selenide, IN2SE3, uh, it has, uh, actually this mismatch I think is a wrong number, it's, it's two and a half percent. Uh, indium selenide is a bent insulator, so it doesn't have uh, any topological property, no, no surface states. Um, but uh, it offers a van der Waals gap, so that means there's going to be a weak bonding, and that means that this is relatively inert, so you should be able to stack those things together uh, quite easily. And this is uh, what they've attempted. Um, and so, <clears throat> They took uh, the aluminum oxide substrate at high temperature, they cleaned it, they grew their three quintuple layer, the bismuth selenide, the disordered uh, um, nucleation layer that they knew they had to do at relatively low temperature. And then what they did, they grew 20 quintuple layers of indium selenide on it, hoping uh, that they have now a good starting point for bismuth selenide. But the problem is that this uh, highly disordered interface that they were forming was was offering also uh, a parallel conduction channel uh, um, to the bismuth selenide that they actually wanted to probe. So, so they had to start thinking about how to get rid of this uh, uh, template layer, this, this disordered bismuth selenide that they had deposited in the beginning. And the uh, solution to this was, um, next slide, was actually to heat the structure. So what they did was they were just heating up the structure and because of the fairly large uh, diffusivity, uh, the bismuth selenide that was formed uh, at the interface, or that was deposited at the interface, made its way through, and uh, they were able to literally have indium selenide fall back down on the aluminum oxide. And you can see here in the uh, transmission electron micros micrograph uh, that this worked uh, relatively nice. So this is an example where the high uh, diffusion that you're going to see in these layered structures can be taken uh, to your advantage. Um, so they were all happy about it, and they started to um, deposit bismuth selenide now on their indium selenide buffer. And uh, they did this at their typical growth temperatures for bismuth selenide. But what they found out was that this was actually too high of a temperature. The, uh, the uh, diffusion that helped them to drive out the disordered interface actually also drove indium into their bismuth selenide uh, layer. And the problem with that is that if you put too much indium into the bismuth selenide, you're going to kill the topological property. So here's a scanning tunneling, uh, scanning tunneling microscopy image of the various defects that were formed at the surface of the bismuth selenide film that was deposited on the indium selenide. And you can see that there's quite a lot of, um, of, of indium uh, sitting in the, in the, in the film. OK, so the solution to this was, uh, and you can see that they're sort of engineering always around the same topic. The solution to this was uh, to introduce um, uh, a diffusion barrier. And so what they found was uh, that bismuth, 
bismuth indium selenide is going to do a pretty good job. They deposited 20 quintuple layers of bismuth indium selenide, and then um, they kept the deposition temperature for bismuth selenide relatively low. And that way, they were able to finally mount high-quality bismuth selenide uh, on their sapphire sample. This is, this is where they started. And uh, uh, all of these uh, you know, materials engineering efforts uh, finally allowed them to have really high quality material. Um, you can see this on the next slide. Uh, you can see that um, if you're comparing the, the different types of substrates that they tried, silicon, aluminum oxide, and this uh, bismuth indium selenide buffer layer, that the lowest sheet carrier concentration they achieved for their uh, templated growth, the same time the highest mobility they also got for their templated growth. They were able to observe the integer quantum Hall effect that was expected for bismuth selenide. And so really the take home message here uh, for, for people who, who want to grow this is that you know, film nucleation, uh, the film growth itself, but also the fusion are things that should seriously be considered as you switch from you know, any type of uh, crystal to these layered types of crystals. OK, so with that, um, I want to move on to the next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the synthesis challenges. Um, and in particular, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, nucleation, uh, nucleation delays, and things of that sort that you might experience uh, when working with these materials. And I want to use as a sort of a working example uh, a, recent, a recent study that was uh, done together with uh, Ari van Duin's group where we looked at the uh, nucleation dynamics of aluminum oxide on, on different uh, chemistry states of the germanium surface. We were looking into hydrogenated germanium 001 as well as uh, oxidized germanium 001. And, and so th the way this experiment was set up was, was in the following. Uh, so this is an overview slide that shows you the, the, the main idea of what we're trying to do. We, on the one hand, on the left side, we have and in situ spectroscopic ellipsometry tool, what you're doing is you have, uh, you have a source and you have a detector. You have uh, different wavelengths of light. Uh, the light is polarized, and you are basically looking at the change of polarization, which depends on the dielectric function of uh, the sample that you're investigating. And if you do a good optical modeling of this, uh, the structure that you're, that you're looking at, you're going to be able to uh, extract uh, the the thickness of the film that you're depositing. And so this is basically what we do on the left. Ideally, we would like to have this with submonolayer uh, resolution. Uh, what uh, Van Duin's group has done on the right is approaching this uh, sort of from, uh, from, from a molecular level. Um, so he is uh, using empirical force fields uh, that were tested against uh, the quantum mechanical solution to be able to set up large simulation scales at low uh, computational cost. Uh, and, and the goal here was to describe reactive events that could uh, occur at these interfaces uh, between our solid surface as well as this gas environment uh, that we had here, um, and trying to help us understand some of the peculiar phenomena that we saw in the deposition process, in particular during the nucleation. And um, so, uh, next slide. Um, the, uh, the way this was done is we first looked at the typical baseline. This is an atomic layer deposition uh, experiment. We used uh, silicon 110 uh, wafers that had uh, nominally 25 nanometer of amorphous silicon dioxide deposited. And we just started to look at what the typical growth process of uh, TMA and water is. And so what you can see is as you pulse your, uh, your trimethyl aluminum in uh, your purchase system and you pulse your water in, you typically see uh, the, the change of thickness as a function of time, which is shown on the, on the top right graph. You can see as, as soon as the trimethyl aluminum pulse, pulse hits the surface, you have a change in the dielectric response. Uh, then you know, the thickness stays constant. This is the time at which you're purging the system. Then you're pulsing water. You, you have a lot of reactions. We're actually splitting off the, uh, the ligand groups from the trimethyl uh, aluminum. Then you have a long purging time again. And then you, can, you, you basically repeat this process. And you do this all the time. And, and what you can extract from this is the height of this pulse, of the TMA pulse, is uh, proportional to the amount of trimethyl aluminum that was absorbed on the surface. And then the difference of the thickness level that you had prior to the whole cycle 
and towards the end of the whole cycle is what we call uh, the growth per cycle. This is basically the amount of material being deposited within one atomic layer deposition type. It's a cycle. And so that's also shown here in the inset. This is the TMA absorption. And then wherever you end up with, this was the growth per cycle for this particular ALD cycle. And so this is how uh, uh, alumina grows if you use TMA, uh, trimethyl aluminum, and water. And if these two uh, molecules see an alumina surface, and so the question was, how are these uh, nucleation kinetics and the whole growth kinetics going to change as you uh, provide another uh, growing surface, uh, such as germanium, um, that's shown on the, on the next slide. So we put a whole lot of effort in, into making sure that we very reproducibly hydrogenate the germanium 100. We've done this in the ALD reactor. Uh, obviously, the ALD reactor was um, equipped with in situ spectroscopic allopsometry. This is the exact same capability that we will have available in the hybrid MBE reactor as well. And what you can see as we started to, uh, to grow alumina using trimethyl aluminum and water, you could see that there was for almost 10 minutes for, you know, close to 30 ALD cycles, there was clearly a nucleation delay. You could see, and it's shown on the, on the lower right graph, that there was the, the baseline, you know, the baseline process for the trimethyl aluminum absorption, which gave us a nominal thickness change of about two angstroms. You can see that in the first 10 cycles, uh, we barely had any, any absorption. So it looks like that whenever you expose trimethyl aluminum to a hydrogenated germanium surface, nothing is going to stick. But then with time, um, there's going to be more and more that's going to stick. You can see that basically this, this pulse here is getting higher and higher and higher with every, with every cycle. And you can also see that the growth per cycle, what you you know ultimately uh, deposit and put down, also keeps growing with the cycles until maybe uh, 25 or 30 ALD cycles. You finally have a complete uh, alumina surface. Now the, the surface state of your, of your growth front is going to look like you would expect for trimethyl aluminum and water. So um, <clears throat> the nucleation delay that we experienced, uh, we thought, is uh, due to a low sticking coefficient of the precursor. But we actually wanted to understand this in more quantitative terms. And so this is where Van Duin's work came in uh, very handy. On the next slide, you see uh, the reactive force field calculation uh, for, for this particular case, the, the upper two graphs basically show you um, the event of uh, trying to absorb a trimethyl aluminum molecule on a hydrogenated germanium surface. And basically what you find that even though uh, this is an exothermic uh, process, the activation barrier to make this happen is, is very high. It's one and a half, close to 1.41 1, 1, uh, 1, 1, uh, electron volts. So it's, it's a very unlikely event to happen. And the reason is that you need to pull out the hydrogen out of the surface. Um, uh, same with uh, water. Water doesn't help you at all. Um, you can see here uh, the reaction profile uh, when you're supplying a water molecule to a hydrogenated germanium surface. This did not come uh, too much uh, of a surprise. Everybody who's working in the clean room uh, with hydrogenated germanium surfaces knows that they are, these uh, surfaces are very hydrophobic, so water just doesn't want to doesn't want to stick to a hydrogenated a germanium surface. Uh, so if you go next slide, then the question is, what makes TMA then ultimately nucleate? And, and what we find was uh, that the nucleation is coming from a dangling bond. So as soon as uh, trimethyl aluminum approaches the surface and we are putting a nucleation center in basically a missing uh, hydrogen bond, then immediately the trimethyl aluminum is going to bond to this uh, to the germanium that has this, this dangling bond. And it's going to uh, uh, basically release one of the CH3 uh, ligands. And this CH3 ligand is then going to grab one of the hydrogens of a nearby uh, bond and going to form another dangling bond. So basically, this process, uh, which is uh, strongly exothermic and barely has any reaction barrier, is really what's going on. And so the nucleation delay is mainly determined by the amount of uh, dangling bond sites that you have uh, in your starting surface. And the reason why we had 25 or so was simply because we had a very good handle in properly hydrogenating our germanium surface. And that's why this was such a pronounced effect. OK, so how is the story 
going to change as you go uh, from a hydrogenated germanium surface to a completely different chemistry. Uh, this different chemistry was uh, uh, having a controlled film thickness of oxidized germanium. Uh, the way we were creating these, uh, you know, these germanium oxide overlayers was uh, by basically uh, having a hydrogenated germanium surface and very carefully oxidized this in situ in the ALD reactor. And again, we used spectroscopic ellipsometry to make sure that uh, the nominal thickness of germanium oxide was reproducible, and we extracted five angstroms for this. And so what you can see here, as you follow the signal from the spectroscopic ellipsometer, this relative thickness, this relative alumina thickness is that you don't have uh, a, a nucleation delay, really. But what you, what you don't have is you don't have any growth per cycle in the beginning. You can see is that at the end of every cycle, there's no change in alumina thickness, even though that you have a very pronounced absorption of the trimethyl aluminum. And so the question is, how is this even possible that if you're absorbing something on the surface, that the nominal thickness is not increasing? So that was very, very puzzling. And um, you know, we, we separated this in various regions. Uh, we basically had a very strong trimethyl aluminum absorption at the very beginning. And then it, it changed moderately. We had more and more TMA absorption, but still a very low growth per cycle. And then it all normalized within like 15 cycles or so to this baseline of TMA and water on an alumina surface. So this is really where, um, uh, where the uh, reactive force field simulations helped us to understand what the actual process is uh, at the molecular level, which is shown on the next slide. Um, so what we found was that uh, trimethyl aluminum, as soon as sees an oxygen in this oxidized surface, is happy and is going to react. But that's not all that's going to do. Here you can see the reaction profile. There's not even a reaction barrier. It just does it right away. A very strongly exothermic uh, reaction process. But there's more that it does. It actually, the germanium that's being formed is getting, uh, is, is slightly diffusing in this germanium oxide um, surface. And so what we also found was that um, there was barely any uptake of oxygen from the water the germanium got oxidized by the oxygen as well, that was already in the germanium oxide layer. So, so this was one of, you know, for us, a very uh, convincing, a non-trivial uh, example uh, how we can use uh, theory and experiment in tandem to successfully identify the reactive processes at play during, uh, during a film nucleation uh, where reactive force field really can help us as an experiment to optimize our growth parameters. And, and we are very, um, uh, very much looking forward to expand this type of uh, recipe uh, to the growth of the calcogenite films uh, once we get going on this. And, and with that, I want to cover the, the last part of my, my talk. Uh, this is really sort of the wrap up of you know, what we are capable of doing here. And I want to give you an idea and a glimpse of uh, how we can monolithically integrate calcogenites uh, with uh, the functional oxides. And this is really an opportunity that's coming from this in vacuum connection of uh, uh, this calcogenite hybrid MBE growth reactor. Um, so what I'm showing you on the next slide is basically an overview of the system that's going to be available. You can see that uh, the system really has two sides. Uh, the left side, the, that sort of the oxide side of things. There's also in situ sputtering uh, uh, reactor available as well. Uh, and then on the right side, uh, there's the calcogenite MBE. Every, every, system, every system side has its own load lock. But there is the ability um, to in vacuum transfer uh, from the oxide side to the calcogenite side, which means that all of the things that we, are, we have a good handle on growing oxide thin films will now also benefit uh, the, the calcogenite side of things. Uh, and on, on top of that, we have uh, a vacuum suitcase uh, that allows us to shuttle samples over to, um, to collaborators um, to have them uh, look and characterize these samples with uh, surface sensitive characterization techniques. So really, um, this multiple in vacuum transfer options uh, that, that this system is equipped with uh, gives us a, a good handle to serve the user community um, uh, and really give, give everybody the chance to make, uh, take full advantage of the characterization cap uh, of the growth capabilities that we have. So here's the sort of the smoking gun uh, uh, example of this. Um, 
Uh, many people uh, got recently interested in, uh, in understanding uh, what iron selenide is doing as you make it very, very thin and as you put this on strontium titanate, uh, a perovskite oxide, and if you have the right uh, surface chemistry and the right uh, surface uh, reconstruction, then iron selenide shows the tendency to be uh, superconducting which it is also in the bulk at the, the superconducting transition temperatures around 8 Kelvin. But it turns out that if you're growing these films, uh, you can increase uh, the transition temperature uh, by, by quite a bit. And so there's a whole lot of interest in understanding why that is. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of discussions now going on in the literature. And uh, so, so obviously, this is really an interesting area for us uh, to combine the promising calcogenite films with the functional ox oxides. Uh, to look and understand better what is actually needed to see these kinds of, uh, uh, I don't even know how to say, it, these kinds of uh, surprising phenomena that you can push these uh, transition temperatures uh, that, that high up. And uh, just, just as an example, uh, on the next slide, the kind of things that you can do is uh, what has been found uh, in a recent paper that uh, these transition temperatures can be pushed up uh, quite high, uh, actually co coincidentally, uh, the transition temperature that was measured and published here for uh, iron selenide was uh, at the same temperature where there's an anti ferrodist sort of transition in strontium titanate. Now, uh, you know, we have a lot of experience in growing strontium titanate. Uh, in particular, we can also grow them on uh, lattice mismatched substrates. And what I'm showing you here is recent results uh, that we've published in my group uh, where we showed that as you start uh, straining the strontium titanate, you're actually able to uh, stabilize different phases uh, at low temperature on the uh, compressor strain, uh, how it's done here, uh, you're going you're gonna to have strontium titanate in a, in a ferroelectric uh, ground state. So you have a polarization, a ferroelectric polarization pointing out of the plane. But along with that, you're also then pushing the anti ferrodist sort of transition uh, to above room temperature. And so this really starts uh, being a new playground to investigate how this coupling between uh, uh, between iron selenide and strontium titanate is going to take place. Uh, basically, an interesting way to think about these hybrid materials interfaces and the things that you can do with this. And, and with that, I want to uh, summarize my talk. Uh, I, I talked about the hybrid growth approaches. So there are some, some interesting uh, opportunities available when you are combining molecular beam epitaxy and chemical vapor deposition in one reactor that uh, can give you advantages in the growth kinetics uh, when you grow refractory metal calcogenite compounds. Um, <clears throat> we have equipped uh, the system to be able to have in situ growth metrologies available to study the non-equilibrium process better that we are planning to uh, combine with uh, uh, you know, simulations that are done on a molecular level to really better understand what's going on uh, I talked a little bit about the lessons learned and the challenges ahead. Um, <clears throat> the, the choice of the correct substrate is key, but you don't necessarily have to rely on substrate. You can also grow uh, buffer layers. Um, and uh, the, the issue of diffusion can uh, help but also haunt you. Uh, these are things that uh, need to be considered. And then, um, and then finally, uh, the monolithic integration of calcogenides with oxides uh, gives, you, gives you access to move into this hybrid material space. Uh, this is really a, a unique opportunity here uh, in the center. And with this, I want to thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. For those of you online who have questions, please type into the chat box, and we'll answer them. Type a little faster. So here we have a question from Barry. Roman? Have you grown any TMDs using hybrid embryos? Uh, and if so, what precursors? No, um, we haven't done this in the MBE. Uh, we started doing this in ALD environment. And um, this, this is an in-house made uh, MB, uh, sorry, ALD reactor that we can pump to, uh, to background pressures of 10 to minus 6. And then we realized that we need a little bit more uh, temperature to do good growth. So then we also changed the, uh, the sample heater. We are able to go up to higher temperature. So by the end of all of these changes, this is more of a dirty MBE reactor than an ALD system. And so 
we have um, we have started this uh, the targeted materials tantalum disulfide, um, but um, I, there's not too many nice things to show at this point. Any other questions online? Okay, if not, we'll uh, we'll go here to the audience for a little bit, and whatever gets queued up, we'll come back to it. Anyone in the audience? Uh, so you mentioned uh, the challenge for using MBE is the temperature and the you know low diffusivity, right? And so um, you you mentioned that the choice of precursor could help with this. What other tricks in MBE can you do to help with this problem? The growth of TMPs. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, there's there's only so many things that you can do. At the end of the day, you have access to three, four parameters that you keep changing. It's temperature, it's growth rate, it's the individual supply rate of the material, and that's pretty much it. And if you now uh, limit yourself to the typical deposition parameters that are that are being used in MBE. There's not too much room to wiggle, and so that's I think the main motivation why we want to go this route is that we can foresee that this might be too tight in order to you know make good material the way we want to do it. So the question is, is there any way to advance or, or broaden beyond this you know very fairly tiny parameter space that is available in molecular beam epitaxy? And we believe that uh, bringing the metal organics on board in this the same reactor is is a, is a potential pathway out of this little little bubble of MBE. So just to follow up on that question, um, so there's some other approaches that I've seen, at least in the growth of nitrides, for, you know, some sort of pulsing mechanisms. I'm not sure the name of them to increase the growth rate. So are these? I mean, will that Kind of apply potentially for TMDs. Um, yeah, you can always pulse. Um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I don't. I don't see. I'm not aware of any showstopper why this would not be working. So, Roman, we have two more questions online. Barry has a second question, and then Irina. Oh, Barry. Um, in my tungsten disulfide ALD. That was actually tantalum. I'm sorry, um, and we used halide precursors. We used uh, tantalum tetrachloride. Sorry, tetrum penta pentachloride. And uh, yeah, so um, uh, Professor Redring just said that you know right next to the MBE lab, there's an MOCVD lab that I occasionally also go. And uh, so I'm, of course, aware that uh, we have those precursors, and we're already playing with those precursors, which just, just uh... so yes, we have those precursors, and we, uh, we, we are currently using them in the MCVD processes. Uh, why is XRD not listed as one of the characterization tools? Um, I'm not sure if I listed characterization tools per se. Uh, to me, uh, you know, X-ray diffraction is, uh, is a key characterization tool to know what phase I have, and uh, what the material quality is. So, I mean, XRD is really one of the characterization tools that I personally put on top of the list. So, so Roman, why don't you just explain the difference between your in situ characterization tools versus those that you use for characterization after you grow a sample? Okay. So, yeah, all of the characterization tools that I was referring to in this talk are the characterization tools that are available uh, in real time while you're growing. And so, uh, all the films that are grown. Uh, you know, will be characterized uh, in our materials characterization facilities, and certainly all of these post-growth analysis uh, uh, X-ray diffraction is going to be among them. Looks like we're getting a bunch queued up online. I think we have time for one more question here on site. If anyone has one, anybody in the audience? Otherwise, we'll turn to the people online who are typing. Looks like Suresh. Uh, Suresh, the vacancies and interstitials are intrinsic to several of the TMDs. Uh, would MOMBE change them? If so, why? 
Um, um, this is a good question. And my answer to this, I don't know right now. Um, you, you know, the, the, the growth process is, is a highly, you know, it's non-equilibrium process. Uh, and so I could foresee that it takes different kinetic routes, which may help you uh, cope with this problem. But I think this is some of the things that need to be explored. So right now, this is not clear, clear to me. So one more question from Barry, and then I think we'll close up the webinar. OK. Seems to have focused. Um, so the business of which precursor is best, um, you know, that's, that's not limited to MOMBE. That's, uh, you know, a general question. And then again, this, this MOMBE approach is, is really, you know, in the limit of low vapor pressure, uh, uh, MOCVD. Um, so, uh, also the the reference that I showed you was fairly old. Um, I'm pretty sure that there are other precursors available. Um, so, I don't see particular advantages. But you know, uh, I think this is this is the beginning of a good conversation. Um, Adri von Doing is sitting in the back. He can he can develop uh, force field models for the different precursors, and then he can just run. Uh, simulations to see how they're going to react and how they're going to behave in in the growth process, and then we have a much better rationale. So 